Hello and welcome to Tour at Home. I am presently at the Wickham Festival, due on stage in an hour and a half, and I am stuck in a muddy field where every car is stuck and I'm waiting for a tractor to get me out. Over there is the stage. The stage has sunk, so we've had to move to a different stage, which seems to be about a mile away. I can hear the band. I'm due on in an hour and a half, so I'm confident I will make it on stage. I am not confident I'm going to make it out of this field. <laughs> This is just, I've never been in this situation before. Um, the only time I did Glastonbury, when that was a, a quagmire, um, I was able to leave my car on tarmac. Here, there just is no tarmac. This is absolutely crazy. My costumes, no point. I'm just going to perform like this, in my boots, in my muddy boots, and just be grateful if I can get home tonight. This is what festivals can be like if you've never been to one and this is part of the joy of the festival. I'm just waiting for the tractor to get me out of the mud. Hello everybody, I'm now back at home out of the mud thanks to the tractor boys at Wickham Festival. Now that opening to me now seems very frivolous because once I got away from my car and got on site backstage at the Wickham Festival, I witnessed an absolutely exhausted and disheartened team of people who'd spent days, even probably weeks, putting up the site for this incredible biblical deluge to just wipe the site out. So the main stage, which was outdoors as part of a COVID restriction, was not usable after this storm. I mean, the field wasn't usable. And as I was on site, you could feel the water just taking your feet away. We weren't on solid ground. So when I arrived on site, there were exhausted stage techs, um, stage builders, lighting people, sound people, caterers. Everyone was fighting the elements to make the show go on and to open on that Friday. So in retrospect, my opening today seems quite frivolous in the light that so many people had worked themselves to the bone to make it possible. So they made it possible for us all to move to a tented stage, which was just perfect. It was fantastic. It could take 5,000 people in that tent and we were sheltered from the rain and everything went on. The show went on and it was glorious and the audience was glorious. But I just want to say thank you. Big thank you to the organisers who fought against all odds to make that festival happen. And I apologise for the frivolous nature of my opening because I... I didn't realise at the time what everyone had been through. I mean, when we go to festivals, even the artists have a lot more fun than the organisers. And to see and witness how demoralised everyone was backstage, and suddenly it just turned around. I think artists accepting the situation, helping make it happen, not making demands, not complaining. <laughs> finding it fun um, because it was so ridiculous it was funny. I, I went to a um, in the middle of the show, I popped off stage, I had a break and I popped off to a porto loo and when I came out there was a queue of people wanting selfies with me and I gave them the selfies but every selfie I was going, I'm due back on stage, I've got to get back on stage. I mean there is something utterly ridiculous about festivals, that they're, they're brilliant but they're also totally insane and Wickham Festival proved that and I just want to say to all of you, absolutely all of you, tractor boys, caterers, stage builders, technical crew, lighting crew, sound crew, the on the ground crew, I mean you are absolutely bloody amazing and thank you, thank you, Thank you. Now, our first song today, I'm incredibly proud of. Sydney Jake has now been teaching me guitar for 10 months and I'm getting there. All my musical instincts, and I have to admit, I have written some brilliant stuff in my career and I'm admitting this because we're going to have a question about ghosts in the universe of prostitutes, which I've just listened to and I'm thinking, this is one of the best things I've ever heard. Um, I think I'm allowed every now and then to pat myself on the back. But with this, I am playing guitar with Sydney Jake on I Want To Be Free. 
I can't tell you what it means to me. In the last 10 months, I have felt my neural pathways connect for the first time ever with my hands. So I can control my hands, I can play and I can sing. And I just feel as though I've been set free. And part of my message to you today is, I'm 63. It is never too late to learn. It's never too late to address something that you instinctively feel you should be doing, but you can't quite achieve technically. It is never too late. Just find the right teacher and, and put the practice in and make the effort and find the time. It's so rewarding. It's so incredibly rewarding and you discover yourself through it. So this is me with Sydney Jake. I'm on guitar and I'm singing and I'm really proud. Enjoy. I want to be free. One, two, three, four. I'm bored. I don't want to go to school. Don't want to be nobody's fool. I want to be free. I want to be me. I don't want to be sweet. I don't want somebody living my life for me. I want to be free. I'm going to turn the world inside out. Going to turn some from ya. Upside down. Going to walk the street. Scream and shout. Going to walk through the alleyways. Being very loud. I don't want to be told what to quit. As long as you're born, who cares? I want to be free. You don't know where you are, burn down the stone, all magazines, pull down the abattoirs, all that you've seen, everything in life should be totally free, live and let live, all of your dreams, turn this world inside out, going to turn suburbia, upside down, going to walk the street, scream and shout, going to crawl through the alleyway, being very loud, going to turn this world. singing I want to be free with Sydney Jake. I can't wait to be able to do that on stage. I will gather the courage to play guitar on stage one day and I am getting there. Sydney, myself and Ellie Williams did some recordings for Cherry Red for the release next year of Anthem and I, I'm on guitar for all those recordings and it sounds and looks really special. I'm so excited, I love it. So I was talking at the beginning of the show about performing at Wickham. I was performing with the SAS band who are a group of musicians that help Queen on the road uh, when they're touring the world. Uh, Spike, Edney, is one of the arrangers um, for Queen's live shows. So it's an absolute honour to work with this band and this class of musician who've been there, done it, seen it all, have gigged all their lives. I was a little nervous on Friday because like all the SAS bands, you're kind of thrown in at the deep end. We do do a day's rehearsal, but then when you get to the show, quite often you don't get a sound check. And I was following the brilliant Andrew Roachford. 
on to the stage he was singing before me and he was so magnificent and so utterly brilliant i thought how do i follow that um and i went on stage and the sound was still sorting out what we needed so at that point all you can do is ground yourself and sing with head memory so you're listening it to your own voice in your head while the, they're giving you what you need which slowly evolves through the situation of performing life but it isn't always there when you start singing and i i felt quite vulnerable uh, on that night because it had been quite an adventure getting to that point but when i came off stage andrew roachford said oh my goodness you are special you've got a voice and i thought that was so kind because <laughs> In the past week, this story has emerged um, from the NME interview, Does Rock and Roll Rot Your Brain Cells? And firstly, there's a story about an altercation with Adamant, which really was nothing. It was absolutely nothing, but everyone's picked up on this story. And basically, you know, Adam and I had a bit of a Barney about me being chucked out of the man eaters on the shoot of Jubilee. Uh, I mean, it saved my career because I went on with the Toya band. Uh, so, you know, no looking back there. And even though I was pretty vo verb vocal, um, Adam stood there like a gentleman and didn't respond and didn't do anything wrong. And I want to just say that now because I just don't want this story to get out of hand. But then it also evolved in the enemy that um, uh, um, Martin Fry of ABC said that I may have a heart of gold, but I was no Aretha Franklin. And for Andrew Roachford on Friday night to say to me, you're special and you have a voice. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Because that means everything to me coming from you especially who you know you've got a voice like Aretha Franklin Woo! so good so wonderful to listen to and just thank you thank you now I know I'm waffling but I want to play you um, something that Tom Robinson filmed on Friday night in the dressing room and this is what the SAS band do before we go on stage it unifies us it signals that we want to work together and it just tells the universe that we want the universe to be kind to us. So this is our dressing room warm up before we walk on stage, shot by Tom Robinson. So Tom, thank you very much. All the way through the good and lean years and through all the in-between years come on band stage ritual before we go on stage most bands have a ritual uh, king crimson they all stand in a circle and they put their fists into the center of the circle where fripp usually makes an inappropriate joke and then they go yeah yeah for me i find i just need silence whether it's a stage play or i'm going on stage with a band my own band i just need to be grounded in silence i don't like the distraction of conversation uh, i, I want to be in that moment and the reason is that every audience has a completely different energy a different feel about them and i want to tune into that it, it interprets the music it helps me interpret myself as a singer on that particular night it's quite an amazing thing and there are a lot of articles um, in magazines and newspapers and online at the moment about understanding silence that it, there is no such thing as silence but what it helps you do is to tune into you your space why you're 
you're here and what the universe is up to. So when, say when we were hunter-gatherers, we had to tune into the silence. It's a bit like that. And I absolutely love it. And thank you, Tom Robinson, for filming that SAS band moment. Our first question today is Lewis Dingley. Have I ever, apart from costumes, taken anything from a film set or a TV set or been given them? This is quite a difficult one, um, Lewis, for me to answer because I, down the road, have an archive warehouse and in that warehouse are my props from Regent's Park, Regent's Park Midsummer Night's Dream where I played Puck where I used my own skateboard and my own roller skates which the stage designers just covered in glitter and the whole idea of my Puck was I never touch the ground. Puck couldn't physically fly, but found other ways of not touching the ground, i.e. wheels. So those are locked away and I can't get to those at the moment. I've got time constraints being on the road. So I do have those, but everything else I have does relate to stage costumes. Um, these are the boots I wore in the photo shoot uh, for the cover of The Changeling the front cover of the changing where i'm sitting on that rock so i have these they're pristine most of my costumes are pristine i'm i'm very very protective of them this is the leotard i wore with kenny everett on the kenny everett tv show when my hair changed color and kenny was going on you know what color is your hair today toya this is the rah rah skirt i wore at the london palladium for the launch of the single Echo Beach with Jimmy Tarbuck introducing. So that tiny little skirt is what I wore and I protect all these things. This is the headscarf of Blue Marigold for Tales of the Unexpected. I was given that, I didn't take it, I was given it. But one of the most beautiful things that I was given and it is a costume, it's not a prop or anything. I keep this kind of airtight sealed and I'm not going to open it fully. Catherine Hepburn allowed me to have the blouse that was made for me in the Cornish Green. So this is kept airtight. It's kept in the dark. It's the actual blouse I wear in the scenes with Catherine Hepburn. And at the end of shooting, she just said, Toya, I want you to have this. Now, I'm not going to unwrap it. This doesn't need air on it, um, but it, it's kept in the archive and for me very, very special and very generous of her to allow me to have it because normally costumes on movies go straight into archives. The Victorian Albert, Muse Albert Museum has all my costumes from The Tempest and some of my stage costumes. They will eventually get the whole lot. Uh, so, you know, these things are looked after. But Frank Finley gave me this wonderful print when I play Peter Pan opposite his hook. Now he's written the date on the back and I can't read it. And it says, Dear Toya, with love, um, Christmas 1994, I think it says. So Frank Finley gave me that and I absolutely, I treasure it, I treasure it. I keep it in my bedroom. Lewis, thank you very much for that question. Mark Ulrich, you say you came to see me twice at Drury Lane Theatre and it was epic. Well, that would have been December 1981, December the 23rd and the 24th. On the 23rd, we did a matinee so the younger fans could see me because the show on the 24th was an old grey whistle test live Christmas broadcast going out to 12 million people viewers and I remember it started at around 10 in the evening which meant there was a curfew for younger people in that theatre. It was quite an experience that week for me and you also ask Mark was my hair real or was it false? Well when John Swannell shot Thunder in the Mountains August 1981 Robert Lebetta did the hair design and did the hair for me. So all of these were hair pieces that took Robert Lebetta and his wife about five days to make because they had to get them really epically solid. Uh, they couldn't move. So these were beautiful, beautiful, absolutely pristine 
accurate pieces of hair. And Robert Labetta was quite obsessive that everything was neat and tidy. So to show you an example, Sean Chapman made these for me uh, when I did an anniversary show at the Shepherds, at the Leicester, Leicester Square Theatre. So the, these are what Robert Labetta did in 1981. Um, that Sean uh, kind of reproduced about 10 years ago. And Sean also did these for me for, for uh, festivals. So this hair is not real. This is almost, well, it's nylon uh, plastic, which means that they can be set rock solid and can kind of survive in the rain. But Robert Labetta created this technique. But by the time that I did Brave New World, that is all my hair except for the blue fan and those little small pieces. So Mark, your question is about Drury Lane, was that my hair? The majority of it was my hair and it was done by Prue Walters. So if we look at the back cover for the 12 inch single release of Thunder in the Mountains, this is all my hair. And then there's a very large hair piece at the back. Well, Prue Walters very much followed that technique using most of my hair for the Drury Lane show. And it took all day to prepare, but she did add long pieces that were false. Now, after about the fifth song at Drury Lane, where I was moving a lot, I was absolutely pouring sweat. My makeup is melting off me and she used um, Aquacolor, which is a German uh, kind of stage makeup which you can get in all different colors she used that on my face but I was sweating profusely and everything was melting and I remember by about the fourth fifth song I had to actually pull some of the hair pieces out because they were just hanging from my real hair and you know this is a live event you go with it you make it happen you stay with it you don't give up you don't freak you just go with it so i pulled these pieces out so at that particular concert the majority was my hair and a lesson was learned that if i was going to use hair pieces they needed to be glued in you couldn't just hair grip them in because my shows are ferociously physical and that night proved it and mark i'm so pleased you got to see both shows that is incredible Incredible. Well done there. Ray Nason, you have asked the question that has absolutely made my day. You've asked, what am I chanting at the beginning of Ghosts in the Universe, which is the last track off my album, my revolutionary album, Prostitute. Now, I've not heard this for at least 30 odd years. And I wrote it with Steve Seidelnick who was the percussionist on this very unique album, which is only voice and percussion. And Steve went on to become Madonna's programmer for quite a few years. I mean, I think at least a decade. So he was great to work with, very advanced to work with. And this song, this song is just absolutely stunning. <laughs> I mean, it's such an angry song. Ghosts in the universe. Ghosts in the universe. Ghosts in the universe. Ghosts in the universe. Here I stand on a large piece of rock floating in the piss pot part of the firmament. I mean, that is one of the most brilliant lyrics I have ever written. This song is outstanding. Uh, I, I get very bruised um, when I release my material because when you make it, you are giving all of you, you open yourself up, you, you open yourself up for praise and also criticism. Uh, and you do get bruised, your ego gets quite bruised. And this is an album that caused uproar when it was presented to the sa the sales teams. I mean, most of them got up and walked out. Uh, I think the original release was on EG and Virgin and, and people were having none of it. I, they didn't want to handle an album called Prostitute. But this went on to become my biggest seller in America. Uh, apparently, no one told me at the time. Um, 
and it is an extraordinary album. So for you to ask, Rai, what I'm chanting at the beginning of this song and draw me back to this absolutely outstanding composition, uh, uh, thank you. You've really, really made my day. So I've gone through the lyrics and I've transcribed what I think I'm singing and chanting at the beginning. And it's Wahine, Waha, Ni, Ni, No, Ne, Na, Oha, Waho. I think that's what I'm chanting. This was such a super intense creative time. Steve Seidelneck and I recorded this album in 10 days and we wrote it as we recorded. Highly experimental. I was very, very angry at the time because I was literally just married to Robert Fripp. And what happened as soon as I married Robert was my past was erased. It was erased by men who said that I was going to give up my career, no point investing time in me, I was going to have children and a family. So they were trying to write my future and I, I became incredibly angry because when you look at my work up until that point, it was revolutionary work. Um, sheep farming in Barnet, Toya Toya Toya, Blue Meaning, Anthem, The Changeling, Love is the Law, making movies with Laurence Olivier, making movies with Derek Jarman, making movies with Catherine Hepburn, Foom! all swept under the carpet and I disappeared into the invisibility of being a wife who was expected to be a mother. So I wrote Prostitute and it's a really angry album. I remember scholars writing to me from America saying it's the most expressive, descriptive album they've ever heard. And when I did Ophelia's Shadow, which followed, I disappointed people that I was no longer angry. Well, Ophelia's Shadow was about being feminine and femininity. It wasn't about anger. So to hear this album again and these outstanding lyrics, outstanding, Outstandingly brilliant. Um, here I stand on a large lump of rock floating in the piss pot, pot, piss pot part of the firmament. We all push me, pull you. Um, F, chuck a buck you. Wall to wall vermin. Piss points pointing in the city shells. Meeting cardboard people. Yapping top table currency. Ghosts in the universe. Hiding in the architecture. Draw up big plans bang to bang design i buy you this you buy that they build this here they knock it down shopping mall propagating paradise is waiting it's all in a handshake expand the big gland ghosts in the universe hiding in the architecture drawing up big plans bang to bang designing i mean it's utterly utterly effing Staggering. And thank you, thank you, Rai, for that question. Ah, I've just taken a moment to get over myself. <laughs> um, if you've not heard Prostitute, get it. It's just breathtaking. It's today, I think it's so relevant for new generations today. And my experience of going back into the live venues is that my audience have suddenly become a lot younger. Um, at Wickham Festival, I mean, I had so many young people just come up to me and go, oh God, you're Toya, you're Toya, you're Toya. And, you know, have discovered me via YouTube. And when you talk about prostitute and the anger of prostitute, it seems so relevant for young people today for the 15 months that they've missed in their lives. As students, as people going into the workplace, I think the anger is very, very present and prostitute is, for me, suddenly become timeless. So I've just taken a moment to get over myself um, from patting myself on my back profusely over that album. Um, Michael O'Brien, thank you. This is the last question today. Did Robert write his own words on Dance in the Hurricane? No. When you heard them for the first time, how did you feel? I wrote those words. I, I'm the lyricist on this project. Uh, so uh, al along with Simon Darlow. Simon wanted an introduction. He had this idea about courtiers coming and bowing to the Crimson Queen, which I have to say I didn't agree with, but I compromised to. Uh, nothing about my life is about courtiers bow bowing to the Crimson Queen. Um, as most performers, the majority of performers in this world, especially female performers, you know, I perform in venues where you're not treated like 
or expect to be treated like a hierarchy and I refused to be part of a hierarchy. Um, so I didn't like this idea at all and I wrote the words and when we came to record them, which we did in this town um, with David Singleton recording them. David Singleton is Robert's manager and does all the, the sound control on um, King Crimson. Uh, both David and Robert, quite frankly, took the piss out of the words uh, and belittled me, uh, which I pointed out and they were very apologetic for. But I was doing something that Simon wanted uh, and I, he wanted a story about Toya that was introducing Toya to new younger generations about this girl who had hair of many colours. So I wrote it um, and, and Robert performed it. If I was to remix this album and, and re-edit it, that introduction would not be on. Uh, so, you know... <laughs> You know, Robert played a part that none of us really wanted to do. And these things happen in the creative process. They happen. Uh, in Posh Pop, I put my foot, feet down a lot more because I've, in the last 35 years, I've not been treated like a rock star. I, I've actually been a survivor uh, and I've kept my work going and I've kept my work alive. And I, I don't want to be perceived perceived in that way and this was actually quite an edgy time finishing off crimson queen and getting dance in the hurricane actually on the album because simon didn't like the song it was me that insisted the continuation of it being written and then the intro was was an add-on and i have to say when we put that intro in the live shows in 2019 i mean people were just laughing so we took it out uh, it's just one of those things but with posh pop when these ideas started to creep in this kind of idealism of being a rock star i put my foot down and i said no i'm not doing it i'm really not doing it because people have been through hell and we're all equal and in covid it was the great leveler and it made us level and i'm not going to kind of prat around being a rock star i'm going to prat around being a survivor who as a female artist has survived and who has held on to everything she has created um and i'm not going to suddenly say look at me i'm glorious and i have huge advances from record labels it's just not true it's not there it doesn't exist uh, so i think a majority of people identify with me because I have fought to keep my presence in this industry. And I don't like stupid little things like women sitting on thrones um, being worshipped. When we shot Sensational, the video, I'm on a throne, uh, and that is actually not a throne to worship at. It's a throne of consciousness where we're all together and I'm holding holding the orb of consciousness up to a child who is Simon Darlow's little boy and handing him the orb. I'm handing him the future. There's nothing about hierarchy there at all. So thank you very much, Michael, for that question. So the last track today on Toya at Home is Summer of Love. And my goodness, this has been so well received. The positivity and the love for this track. So many people are saying so far, this is their favorite track. And they already loved Levitate and Zoom Zoom. Well, you've got a few more goodies to come. You've got at least seven more tracks to come. And I'm pretty confident the best are still to come. So this is Simon Darlow and I in Simon's studio where we recorded and wrote Posh Pop doing the acoustic version of Summer of Love. Enjoy. I will see you soon for Burning Guitars, Postcards Home, Love Letters to Robert tomorrow, which is really beautiful tomorrow. And just look after yourselves. And it looks like live shows are able to continue, which is just amazing because I am in rehearsals with the Posh Pop Band and it's sounding like nothing I've done before and I'm very excited by it. So stay safe, see you soon. Lots of love from Toya. Don't you know, desire feeds your mind. Don't you know what you see is like a dream? Do you believe what you're told is true? It's 
Let's go outside.